you could turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, we are getting back into our series in Revelation. We have, we'll be preaching about till mid-February through the rest of Revelation. Revelation chapter 20, one of the most difficult and complex and disputed passages, maybe in the whole Bible, Revelation chapter 20. Hear now God's holy, infallible, and inerrant word to us this morning. John says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on those thrones were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years and the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful to you for your word. We confess our own neediness. Lord, we are confronted with a very difficult passage. This is your word. We thank you for it. Help us, Lord, to understand it. Help me to preach it with clarity, that everything that I say would be correct. Uh, Lord, we uh, look forward to uh, worshiping you as we dive into this text, Lord, as it all points us to Christ and what he has done in history to redeem a people for himself. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we get back into the book of Revelation... I thought it'd be helpful to just give a brief review uh, about what we're talking about here in the book of Revelation. In contrast, as we said, in contrast to those, uh, to those who hold that Revelation mostly has to do with things that are going to happen in the future, and in contrast to those who call themselves partial preterists or post-millennial, who say that What happens in Revelation mostly has to do with the past and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Uh, We hold to what we're calling the redemptive historical symbolic view, or that is the amillennial, really the now, the present millennial view, which teaches this, that Jesus, using symbols rooted in the Old Testament, reveals the outworking of the triune God's redemptive plan in history and the spiritual warfare that we endure throughout this age, culminating in his return, which will bring the final judgment and usher in the age to come and the creation of a new heavens and a new earth. I think that's ultimately what the book of Revelation is teaching us. That's what the, at the heart of the book of Revelation. And We left off, or with the book of Revelation, we've seen that there are seven cycles of visions set forth in the book of Revelation, and those seven cycles of visions retell that story that you see on your screen. It retells the story, the outworking of God's redemptive plan in history and our spiritual warfare with the devil culminating in Christ's return, these seven cycles retell that story over and over again through these different cycles, through different angles. And it shows us that there's application to Christians in every age. 
There's application to Christians who were alive at the time that John was writing, the seven churches that we saw in chapters 2 and 3. There's application to those Christians who will be alive at the end of time. But there's also application for us today, for Christians down through the ages. Now, we left off Revelation having worked through the sixth cycle of visions in chapters 17 through 19, and there we saw the fall of Babylon the Great, the great prostitute, that is the fallen world system that, that lures and tempts mankind to sin and, and instigates and, and wants to uh, stir them up to, to persecute the church. And we saw how Chapters 17 through 19, it talks about the fall of Babylon the Great, and then it culminates in chapter 19 with the marriage supper of the Lamb and the return of Christ. And so now we come to chapter 20, and what we see here, as I've said, is one of the most complex passages in one of the most, if not the most complex book of the Bible. And because of that, there are differences among Bible-believing Christians in terms of what exactly is going on here in this passage. What is this 1,000-year period of time that's spoken of? When does it occur? How long is it really? Uh, what about the binding of Satan? What does that mean? What's in view with that? What is this first resurrection? Uh, what is it? When does it occur? Who does it refer to? All of these questions here are here in this text and that are answered for us. And what I want to do this morning is, is lay out the different views on the 1,000 years here because the 1,000 years is so prevalent in the text. Lay out those different views and then present to you the now millennial view, the now millennial perspective. And with that, the main idea that we're going to look at this morning is that because Christ has bound Satan for 1,000 years, the saints in heaven shall reign as priests with Christ during this age. This age. The time from when Christ ascended up to his second coming. This age. As the gospel is spread to the nations. Christ has bound Satan 1,000 year period of time, reigning from heaven, as the gospel goes forward over the face of the earth in this age. Now, three things we're going to look at. What is the 1,000 years, the binding of Satan, and the spread of the gospel to the nations? As I said in Sunday school, before we get started, uh, if you've never taken a sip through a fire hose, well, if you were in Sunday school, you did that, and today you're going to get that with the sermon. So, <laughs> I'll try to make that as pleasant as I possibly can, but there's a lot of information for us to map, wrap our minds around. First point, what is the 1,000 years? We notice six times in Revelation 20, we see a reference to this 1,000-year period of time, and there's a couple of things now we need to understand before we examine the 1,000 years. First of all, this is the only passage in the Bible that speaks of a 1,000-year reign of Christ. And it is found in this complex book that uses symbolic imagery and uses numbers symbolically. So right away, we're, we, have a, we, we understand that, and that's going to have an impact on how we understand this passage. And what comes into view here, because of these things, is a key principle of biblical interpretation. It's the, and the principle is this. We must interpret Scripture with Scripture and the less clear things in light of the clear things, not the other way around. We don't take the things that are less clear and then interpret the things that are clear in light of that. It's the opposite way around. And so this text here cannot be the steering wheel of the car of eschatology. The rest of the New Testament must inform us about what is happening here because of all the symbolism and the complexities and the lack of clarity, relative lack of clarity. And with that in mind, 
This text presents us, there's the different views we're going to look at, the, the millennial views, the premillennial view, the postmillennial view, the amillennial view. Each view is presented with difficulties by this text that are difficult to reconcile with their view. And basically what we're coming down to then is you're having to say, what does the preponderance of the Bible teach regarding these things? Which one has the least amount of difficulties in reconciling these things? That will very likely be the correct view. But with that in mind here, we see here, I'm put, putting this before you, the challenges with this text. We see those things. And what I want to say now is, with those things in mind, is that we must allow for disagreement on these things amongst Bible-believing Christians. We must be exceedingly gracious towards those who disagree. So I'm certain that there may be some of you here today who are not going to agree with the things that I say. And so please understand that these are not shots taken at you. I'm just trying to put before you what the Bible teaches on these things. Here's the different views, and here's where we come at these things. And I do this in a spirit of grace. And we need to have grace toward others regarding these things. Right, all things, but especially things like, like this. And so that takes us then to the different views of the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. What are the different views that Christians hold to regarding the thousand years? What are those views? Well, I thought it might be helpful to provide charts. Maybe not. It might be more confusing. I don't know. I'll try to explain it the best that I can here. We have, first of all, the premillennial view. The premillennial view, there's really two flavors of premillennialism. There's historic premillennialism and dispensational premillennialism. Now, with the historic premillennial view, it teaches that Christ returns before the 1,000 reign on earth. Christ comes back to earth prior to his 1,000-year reign on earth. That's why it's called premillennial. And this view would teach that at the end of the tribulation, Christ returns. When he returns, he binds Satan. He reigns in Jerusalem for 1,000 literal years. Satan is then released. There's a rebellion against Christ. That rebellion is defeated. And then there's the final judgment. And then the creations of the new heavens and a new earth. What you need to hear there hopefully you caught it, is that Christ comes back to earth, but when he comes back to earth, he doesn't create, doesn't consummate his kingdom, he doesn't create a new heavens and a new earth. There is not the final judgment. There's a 1,000-year period of time before those things happen. He's on earth reigning on earth with his people who are resurrected and non-resurrected people who repopulate the earth. That's the historic premillennial view. Another flavor of premillennialism, and this is probably the most prominent position held by many evangelicals today, at least since the mid-1800s. This view became popularized in the 1800s, mid-1800s. So it teaches, again, that Christ returns before his 1,000-year reign on earth. Dispensationalism, though, it says that there's actually two different peoples of God. There's Israel, and there's the church. There's two different programs for Israel and the church. And the church age is, they say, a parenthesis. In other words, this wasn't something that was anticipated. It's something that's kind of come in when the Jewish people rejected Messiah, and now that began this parenthetical phase of time called the church age. So, there'll be, Christ will rapture his church, then there'll be seven years of tribulation, the temple will be rebuilt, Christ then will come back and reign on earth for 1,000 years, temple sacrifices, 
The temple will be rebuilt. Sacrifices will be reinstituted as memorials. Then there'll be a great rebellion. The rebellion will be put down. Will be put down. And then there'll be the final judgment. The next view is called post-millennialism. And again, there's two flavors of post-millennialism. There's what we just call post-millennialism, and then there's amillennialism. If you're confused, hang in there. I'll explain what I mean. Post-millennialism teaches that Christ returns post or after the millennium. Some say, who hold it a post-mill view, that the first coming of Christ, uh, the, the millennium began with the first coming of Christ. And others say that the 1,000 years will begin at some point in the future. So there's disagreement amongst those who hold to the post When does the 1,000 year begin? Some say the 1,000 year period of time starts with the first coming of Christ and runs the full course of history. And others say the 1,000 year period of time starts at some point in this age. And what they all say is, is that during this age, the Great Commission advances and it succeeds in Christianizing the world. That doesn't mean that all people are made Christians, but most are. And all of the institutions in the world are Christian or Christianized. And so they look forward to a prolonged period of time on earth prior to Christ's return where as Kenneth Gentry, who holds to this position, says, quote, righteousness, peace, and prosperity will prevail in the affairs of men and nations. So, there'll be a time on earth before Christ comes, the church will win, will Christianize the world, ushering in this age, we just call it a golden age of righteousness and peace, on earth. Then there'll be a minor, minor outbreak, and then we'll see return of Christ. Christ will return after the golden age. That takes us to the amillennial view. The amillennial view is a misnomer, because ah implies that there's no millennium. That's not what's being taught with the amillennial view. The amillennial view teaches that the millennium is now. It is post-mill in that Christ returns after the 1,000 years. So for the amillennial perspective, the entire period of time from Christ's ascension into heaven to his second coming is called the 1,000 years. The 1,000 years is a figurative amount of time, a prolonged period of time. And so the amillennial says, the millennial reign of Christ, the ascended Christ, the exalted Christ, King Jesus, is happening now, spiritually, in and through his people. The kingdom is present now, or already, spiritually, and it is spread through the church, and it does succeed in winning all those that Christ has determined to save. So we are optimistic in saying, yes, the church, it goes into the nations. And we see the nations come to Christ. People from every nation, tribe, and tongue come to faith in Christ. All of those that were given to Christ shall be saved. But that does not imply that, that, them be, that the whole world will be Christianized. And so we say that there'll be, that, that the kingdom is now. Satan is bound during this time. His influence is restrained, so he can't impede the gospel. During this present age, the millennial reign, it happens now because of Christ's death on the cross, his resurrection, and his present reign from heaven. At the end of the millennial age, Satan is released. There's a rebellion, great apostasy. Then Christ returns physically, defeats Satan, brings in the final judgment, and then the not yet of the kingdom is fully realized in the age to come with the new heavens and the new earth. And so 
the true golden age on earth is at Christ's return. For only then will sin and death and the devil be eradicated. The new heavens and the new earth, that's the longing for the Christian. That's when righteousness will dwell on the earth and peace will dwell on the earth at the return of Christ. Now, what's, what's the biblical support for? Well, there's an expanded uh, chart for more. If you want to be even more confused, you can look at that chart. If you look at it long enough, it's like, oh, I'm, it makes sense. <laughs> That's a really good one, by the way. I like when it says, you know, evangelism of all the nation's success. That's what we need to understand. We're going to talk more about that as we go on. But what is the biblical support for the amillennial position? Well, first of all, we see, because we're saying that the thousand-year period of time is symbolic. The thousand years just represents the entire period of time from Christ's ascension to his second coming. That could be, it's been 2,000 years already. We don't know how long it's going to be. But that's what's in view with the millennial reign of Christ. And so, how do we prove this view? Well, first of all, because symbolism is used throughout the book of Revelation, and it continues in this text when it speaks of, we see that the great angel has the key to the abyss. We see he has a great chain. We see he calls Satan a dragon. We see he's sealed in a great pit. All of these things are clearly symbolic imagery meant to convey that there's been a, convey there's been a great restriction placed upon Satan, not that he's in literal chains. Satan is a spiritual being. And so clearly what's in view here is symbolic imagery. But then we also recall that numbers are used symbolically throughout the book of Revelation. We've seen the symbolic use of the number 7, and the number 3, and the number 10. The number 144,000. For the number 1,000, 1,000 is 10 cubed. So it's a perfect full number. And so the idea is that the 1,000 years is not literal calendar years, but is symbolic for a large and complete period of time. We see the symbolic use of 1,000 years in other places in Scripture. For example, Psalm 90, verse 4, For a 1,000 years in your sight, O Lord, are but as yesterday when it is past. Clearly a symbolic use of 1,000 years. We see 2 Peter 3. One day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. So we see here the symbolic use of numbers. It's very consistent then to say that this 1,000 years is symbolic for a large period of time. Secondly, Scripture only knows of two ages. Two ages. This age and the age to come. So now, you'll have to bear with me, because I have some passages for us to look at. Two ages. First of all, Luke chapter 30, 34 to 35, Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age, what age? That is the age to come, and to the resurrected from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. So there, there you see clearly there are two ages. There's this age. Then there's an age to come. We see Jesus on the Great Commission. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What age? This age. This time. But you see, there's going to be an end to this age, which means what? There is another age to come. Ephesians makes it clear, Paul, that he, the Father, worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, that entire period of time from Christ's ascension to his return, but the one to come. Two ages. This age and the one to come, which happens at Christ's return. Galatians 1, 4, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. Again, you see 
the implication, the inference clearly that there are two ages. There's this age, this present evil age, and then the age to come. So there's only two ages. Paul, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time. What's this present time? It's the world we live in. That's the way things are going to be. That's what Jesus has promised us in this age, in this time. You're going to suffer. You're going to experience persecution. You're not greater than your master. Right? This is what we've been appointed to. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with what? The glory to be revealed. And when will that be revealed? When Christ returns. So we see this time, and then there's that time. Paul continues, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? No, in all what? These things. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us, for I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels, rulers, nor things present, we could say in this age, or things to come, we could say when Christ returns, or we say in the age to come, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But you see here what Paul points to. This is the consistent testimony of Scripture about what we've been appointed to in terms of the suffering of this age. Paul says in Philippians, it's been granted to you to believe and to suffer for his sake. And there's no point in in this age when that stops. That's what we've been appointed to. And so, Peter says, you do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. Here we see, again, a symbolic use of a thousand years. People were saying, where is Christ? This is back then. <laughs> you talk about his return. He seems like he's delayed. But don't, don't think he's... He's patient, not wanting any of you to perish. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away. Verse 13, but according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's important. Why? Because we talked about the post-millennial uh, golden age, which says righteousness will, will abound in this age. But I think Peter is clear that that won't happen until the new heavens and the new earth are created. That's when that happens. So we see these two ages. So with loving respect and gentleness to my premillennial friends who might disagree, here are some things. Contrary to premillennialism, these are not three ages, or there are not three ages. This age, the millennial age, and then the eternal state. There's only two, right? We just saw the scriptural testimony. There's this age and the age to come. The premillennial view posits three ages. This age, then a 1,000 year reign, and then the age to come. The premillennial view teaches the second coming of Christ doesn't result in the creation of a new heavens and a new earth. Right? Come, Christ comes to earth. His return doesn't result in a new heavens and a new earth. Rather, he's, when he returns, the earth is still subject to the curse and death and disease as he's reigning here on earth. But it hasn't been transformed. Those things are still going to be existent in the 1,000-year period of time according to when Christ returns, according to the premillennial view. But Scripture teaches that the day of the Lord, the return of Christ, results in a new creation. The premillennial view teaches that after Christ returns, he spends 1,000 years on earth with resurrected believers who coexist with those not resurrected. They remain in the flesh and marry and repopulate the earth. Yet 1 Corinthians 15 says that flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom, which will be consummated at Christ's return, not 1,000 years later. So just my own opinion, I think of all the positions, I think this is probably the least likely. 
it certainly doesn't have, it, it has the least amount of support in church history for what that's worth. I think it's the least likely. It could be correct, but I, I just think there's just too many things about it that don't comport with Scripture. What about the post mill view? Well, this present evil age will always be marked by suffering for the Christian, not glory. As much as we would love to see that, that's just not what the Bible teaches. The expectation for this age will always be cross, not crown. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. But see, there, but people say, well, he was talking to his disciples. Yes, he's talking to them, preparing them, and for all disciples of all ages, what they can expect. When we read that, we think that's the expectation. And we count it joy. Because we're living for the Lord in this present evil age and suffering for Christ. That's not pessimism. That's a holy optimism and saying, thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here and to suffer for your sake. Righteousness will not dwell on the earth in the sense that they say until the age to come. We saw that with 2 Peter. There are not three ages, this present evil age and a time of unprecedented peace and righteousness on earth and then the age to come. There's this age which is marked by suffering for Christ and then the age to come. And then the post-millennial view ultimately is, I would call it, an over-realized eschatology because it posits this golden age on earth before Christ returns. It's, it's an over-realized eschatology it blurs the distinction between the already and the not yet. The glorious things that will happen after Christ returns, it brings them into the now. And I think the scripture doesn't go there with that. So there's your millennial views. Here's the amillennial view in a nutshell. The millennium is the period of time between the first and second comings of Christ, where the exalted King Jesus reigns from heaven and spreads his spiritual kingdom now on earth through his church in this age. At the end of this age, he will return to usher in the age to come as he creates a new heavens and a new earth wherein righteousness will dwell forever. I humbly submit to you that that is clearly what Scripture teaches in the rest of the New Testament. And I think it comes clear here in Revelation 20. And throughout the book of Revelation, as we've studied it the past year and a half or so. So that's the view that we subscribe to. That takes us then to the second point. And we'll take a deep breath. Okay, are we good? All right. The binding of Satan. More things for us to think about now. <laughs> Having just spoken of the second coming of Christ in chapter 19, John says, verse 1, then I saw. Now this leads some to say that this here, what's happening here in our text, happens chronologically after chapter 19, after the return of Christ. However, as we said, John uses this phrase, then I saw throughout the book of Revelation to speak about what the next vision is, not what will happen in history. Make sense? Then I saw, it doesn't mean this is the next thing that's going to happen in history. It just means this is the next vision that I saw. It could have happened after chapter 19. It could have happened before chapter 19. I think it, it happens before chapter 19. And then later on in chapter 20, we're going to see how those it does. There is a correlation. So it's just the next vision that John sees. And we see this throughout Revelation. John restates the same events from different camera angles. In the previous vision, the attention was focused on the demise and the defeat of the beast of Babylon the Great and the false prophet and the return of Christ. Now the camera angle zooms in on Satan and the course of history from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. And so questions that arise here are, how does the gospel advance to the nations in this age? 
What happens to believers when they die? What will happen at the final judgment? Those are the questions that are really underlying Revelation chapter 20. How does the gospel advance to the nations? What happens to believers when they die? What will happen at the final judgment? Now, John sees an angel coming down from heaven. And because he has a key to the bottomless pit, which is the abyss, and we saw in Revelation chapter 10 that, that this angel, this glorious angel, we believe is clearly Christ, I think this is Christ as well. And in verse 2, we see a collection of terms that are used for Satan, which all speak to his nature. He's called the dragon, which speaks to his monstrous ferocity. He's called the ancient serpent. He's crafty. He's deceptive. Of course, that takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve. He's the devil. He's the slanderer. He's Satan. He's the adversary. So we have all these terms being said about Satan, and what it shows is that Satan is a formidable foe. He's a very formidable foe. He's a powerful foe. But notice, he's seized. Despite him being so formidable, he's no match for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He just seizes him like he's a powerless, puny little animal and, and binds him and shuts him in the pit for a thousand years. Now, all of that imagery clearly, I believe, is symbolic. The chain, the binding to the pit, all that's symbolic. The point is to convey what? It's to convey the absolute sovereignty of Christ over Satan and that Christ has defeated Satan and has put a restraint on him. That's the point. The point of the imagery is to show just how powerful Christ is and the depth of the restraint upon Satan that's been placed on him by the sovereign, crucified, raised, exalted, glorified Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So, why? Why is he bound? And the answer comes out, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. That is, until the purpose of the 1,000 years were fulfilled or completed. At that point, Satan is released so that he can once again deceive the nations, resulting in worldwide onslaught against the church, ending in Christ's return from heaven. Now, to understand this binding, we need to ask the question, when did this binding of Satan and this restraint upon him occur? A couple of really helpful passages for us to look at. Matthew, Jesus says, if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, and the kingdom of God has come upon you. See, the kingdom isn't entirely future, is it? <laughs> it was manifested in Jesus' life and ministry. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first, what? Binds the strong man. It's the same word that's used here in Revelation 20. Then indeed, he may plunder his house. This binding here, again, is the same word used in Revelation 20. So the binding actually began, notice, during Jesus' public ministry and refers ultimately to Christ's defeat of Satan through his perfect life, ministry, death on the cross, and bodily resurrection. And that is seen, becomes more clear when we see what Paul says in Colossians 2. Paul talks about how Jesus canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Before we speak more about this, I want you to just stop for a moment. I want you to reflect on what Paul has just said. That the record of debt that you had before a holy God was nailed to the cross. That mountain of debt that grew every single day in word, thought, and deed. All of your sin was nailed to the cross in Christ. That, dear friends, is what Christ has done for you and for me. 
amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And then we see the result here. He, verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. You see that? He disarmed the powers of principalities, the, the, the demonic realm. He has rendered them powerless to do what? Powerless to prevent the spread of his spiritual kingdom on earth through his church, his spiritually empowered people. Jesus said in John 12, Now is judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Cast out. It's the same idea as the binding, as the restraint. Notice, it's through the death of Christ. And because of that now, we see the way has been cleared now for Christ, his crucifixion, for him now to draw all people to himself. What people? Every person on the earth without exception? No. All those that were given to him from before time even began, people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. All those without exception. Every single one of his sheep who are scattered over the whole world shall be saved. Why? Because Christ has cast out, he has bound, he has disarmed the enemy of the souls of his elect. Nothing can stop Christ from saving his people. There's true power in the blood. And that takes us to the third point, the spread of the gospel to the nations. Back to Revelation 20, when it says Satan is bound. So he might not deceive the nations any longer. The idea isn't that Satan doesn't have any power. It's a particular kind of deception, I believe, that's in view. Because the word can mean to seduce a people into rebellion. It's that kind of deception that I think that is highlighted in, chapters, in verses 7 and 8. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison. He will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. That's the deception in view. That doesn't happen until the end of the age. Christ now prevents Satan from mobilizing the world to destroy the church. This comes out in 2 Thessalonians. For that day, the return of Christ will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, and you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. Notice there's restraint. Here, right? The restraint. But when he's restrained, when, when that restraint is removed, what happens? Satan then, with all powers and false signs and wonders, will deceive, with wicked deception, will deceive those who are perishing. But that doesn't happen until the end. Once God removes the restraints, the great deception will happen. And as we saw in other places of Revelation, Satan and his hordes will be released. They will stir up the nations to try to lay waste the church, but it ultimately will not succeed. We're almost done. Hang in there. But now, while Satan is bound, Satan still roams like a lion. He still twists, he still distorts, he still blinds, he still deceives people. He still shoots his fiery darts at believers. And we see this in verses 4 through 6. As believers suffer persecution and are killed for the cause of Christ. But all who trust in Christ experience resurrection. Paul, or it's called here the first resurrection. The Apostle Paul in, chapter, in Ephesians says, God being rich in mercy because of the great love of which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, did what? Made us alive. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places. Positionally, that's where we are as believers. And so the point in all this is that there is true power in the blood of Christ. By the death of Christ, he has crushed the head of the serpent. He has disarmed the powers and principalities he has risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, he has seized the dragon, he's bound him for a thousand years. That is the entirety of this age, this present age. Why? And it goes back to the purpose for which he came, 
I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's why. So Christ isn't building nation states on earth. He isn't creating a utopia on earth during this age. Rather, he is building his church, his spiritual kingdom on earth, one lost soul at a time. He has restrained Satan's ability to deceive the nations. Satan cannot stop the church from advancing on earth. And now Christ fills his people with his spirit, He transforms us and calls us to go and do what? Make disciples of the nations. With this hope in mind, with this sure knowledge in mind, He doesn't send us on a mission that will fail. He doesn't send us on a fool's errand. It will succeed because Christ has bound Satan. And Matthew 12, 29, Jesus is now plundering the house of Satan, the fallen world under His sway, through his church that declares the gospel throughout the world. As I bring this to a close, the call goes out then to all to repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Have you done that? If you have not, I plead with you today, turn to Christ, turn from your sins, turn to the one who bore all of your sin on the cross and offers you the gift of eternal life. And if you have, let us be encouraged by the fact that we serve a mighty Savior. Let us be encouraged by the fact that Christ is victor. He has defeated Satan, and he will defeat Satan finally and fully at the end of time. He has transformed us and is transforming us by his Spirit, and he sends us out now in the power of his Spirit to declare his glorious gospel. And those who have died in the faith are reigning with Christ even now to the glory of God. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. So much there to unpack. But Lord, what a glorious passage. We thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you've done for us.